Hey everyone, welcome to the Camino Cafe. We're so happy that you're joining us at our table today. We have a really exciting um, folks here today that we're gonna be talking to, but I wanted to make a couple of quick announcements. If the voice sounds a little bit better today, that is thanks to the Camino providing. Uh, we had a listener, a fellow Camino pilgrim, and that is Allison and John Benetto. And they uh, just reached out to me. We haven't ever met in person, but they've been listening to the show and we're probably noticing that the sound wasn't always that great. And they just happened to have an extra mic and they gifted that to me. So I just wanted to say a special, special thanks to Allison and John for doing that. And just to show everyone that the Camino continues to provide long after you finish. And I am living proof of that many times. Um, it's amazing. I also wanted to mention that if you are watching on YouTube, please subscribe, give us a thumbs up. We love the feedback and the more feedback that is posted, the more times the video is gonna get shared or will come up on people's searches. So we really appreciate that. Also, if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, we would love it if you would give us a rating of five stars if you love it and also subscribe to the episodes. So if I seem a little excited this morning, it is because I just came off of an amazing Camino Pilgrim weekend. I was on Bashan Island with Phil Holker and all the Camino heads, and what an amazing weekend we had. It was full of pilgrim love, and uh, I just want to give a big shout out to all the Camino heads and to Phil. Uh, you may have already, by the time you watch this or listen to this, you may have already heard his episode. We uh, did two interviews live right there on Vashon Island. So it was an amazing weekend and I, I'm already missing all of my new Camino family members that I met that weekend and uh, what a joy it was to see Phil. So anyway, we'll that shout out. But today we are here with Kelly and Jeff Vildara. Did I get that right? You did. The close. <laughs> Close. All right. <laughs> Close. All right. Well, what, what is it? Let's make it, get it official. How do you pronounce your last name? It's Field Dara. It's fine. Dara. You did great. Phil Dara. <laughs> All right. All right. Okay. So, um, wow. I'm so excited to have Kelly and Jeff here with us because they have an amazing blog. I first found out about them from Maria Seiko, you know, my Spanish teacher for all of you that have been oh, yeah. listening. And Maria said, Hey Lee, you got to interview Kelly. You need to be checking out her blog. So I did that several months ago and I've been following her blog since then. And finally got the nerve to reach out to them and, and invite them to be on the Camino Cafe. So they are currently sitting in Spain. They're in Galicia. So we'll have them tell us more about that. But you can see on their screensaver uh, what, a, what a beautiful virtual background they have there. So Kelly and Jeff, could you kind of just give everybody an idea of where you guys are located on the Camino Frances? Sure. Actually, Jeff has a map. Sure. Okay, cool. So we'll show you. So <laughs> there you go. Um, we're in Galicia. It'd be halfway between Palestare and Malede. And we're right on the Camino at about kilometer marker of number 59. So 59 kilometers to Santiago. Okay, great. So we're, great. Th That's we're three days. We're three days from Santiago. Okay, that is a beautiful area. So beautiful. Yeah, yeah. So now you guys were originally, when you filed for your visa, you were living in Arizona. Is that, were you from Arizona originally or from Seattle? Because I saw some Seattle, Seattle stuff too. Okay, all right. Yeah. I'm on Bainbridge Island, so. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, so very familiar with Seattle. So, so Kelly, you walked the Camino first for your family, and that was back, what, in 2017. And you walked with your daughter? Yes, our daughter, Emily and I walked it together. Um, she's now in college and, and uh, in the US, but um, she was 15 and uh, she, she uh, wanted to go originally. Um, I had uh, asked my son, my older son to go and he said, now I have no desire to walk 500 miles across Spain in the heat. And, uh, and Emily said, I'll go mom. And so she came and, and I think it was, um, you know, it's, like any experience with a teenager, um, but it was transformational for her. Mm -hmm. And uh, it certainly uh, was a big boost for her college essays. Um, oh but God. since, yes, but since then, um, it's been a big part of, of like a grounding thing for her, for her life. Um, you know, she got a lot out of it and as did I, um, and we came back and, and we were just, you know, I, we both felt like we needed to, we need to go back to Spain and Jeff had never been. Um, and so we, you know, he was, he was all in. 
So that's what we did. Yeah. That's such a cool story. So Kelly, where did you first hear about the Camino? How did you even know about it? Um, uh, Paulo Coelho's book, uh, The Pilgrimage. Mm -hmm. Um, I read yes. it probably, you know, in the nineties sometime, I'm a big fan of his and, and, uh, I loved the idea that, you know, he was, he felt like he, he'd reached this sort of spiritual place that, you know, he was getting ready to be given the sword, right. The keys right. and they, they took them away from him and said, no, you, you have to go do this thing. And, and, um, I loved that. Um, sort of humbling that he had, um, even when he felt like he'd reached the pinnacle. And, and I, I, I don't know, it just resonated with me. So I always really wanted to go. And then I sort of had a, a crisis of, I don't know what you would call it, but I, I was, I guess, corporate burnout would be <laughs> what I had. Yeah. Um, and my husband said, you should go walk, take that walk in Spain. And I was like, that's what I should do. Um, Cause I was sort of at loose ends at that point. And um, I'm really, really glad I did. Mm -hmm. So I changed everything, so. Yeah, I guess so, right? <laughs> you go going to take this walk in 2017 and by what, 2018, you guys were living in Spain? Or yeah, did we it take until 2019? 2018, we, we, we moved um, March 1st and we moved to Valencia first. Um, Jeff has some pictures. Yeah. So. Uh, you'll see. So, so Valencia is on the Mediterranean, like as far, almost as far away from here as you can get. Right. And we moved March first um, during Fias. Do you know anything about Fias and no, Valencia? No. Yeah, we didn't know a lot about it either, but we okay. learned. Um, you can talk about what that was like to move during Fias. It's okay. So it, it lasts about three, three and a half weeks in March, and Fias is basically like the 4th of July every day. There's fireworks every day. Oh, wow. And they build these enormous effigies. You can see them behind us here. And yeah. on the last day, like on- I 700 guess, of them yeah, throughout the city. 700 throughout the city. So almost every intersection has is blocked by these giant uh, structure, these giant sculptures. They're, they're made out of foam um, and they're painted. All the neighborhoods get together and they, they build these things. And on the last day of the celebration, they light them all on fire. So the whole city looks like it's on fire. Wow. And yes. yeah, so this, this is a tr it's the tradition they've had for hundreds of years. Um, and they have, um, what are the girls called? Fieras? Fieras. 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 Yeah. So they, all the girls compete. It's kind of like a, like a pageant, not, kind of. Yeah. It's kind a pageant. of a pageant. Yeah. And they are the like the neighborhood representative for the next year. That each neighborhood gets a faella. Yeah. Wow. So that's like what a welcome the picture there. So yeah. So we moved March March first. March first, right at the very beginning of it. And for the first month we were there, it was total chaos and loud every night. It the fireworks go off twenty four seven. Yes. Wow. And if you know anything about Valencia, Valencia is the fireworks capital of Spain. They okay. manufacture fireworks there. You can get a degree in pyrotechnics at the Valen University of Valencia. Oh, so um, people throw fireworks at you. Yeah, it was a it was an amazing, uh, um, a literally trial by fire of moving to Spain. Yes. <laughs> I guess so. Yeah. Well, let's back up a little bit. So, Jeff Kelly, Kelly, you encourage Kelly to go do this. She's having this corporate burnout. And you support, like, hey, go, you need to go. You're encouraging her. And yep. then she comes back. She and Emily is Emily is your daughter? Emily, yes. yes. Emily. Yeah. Um, so you they come back. And it sounded like when I was reading a blog that you had written, I think it was a couple of words that you had written that um, you were really up for moving, making this move to Spain. It looked like you'd always lived a pretty adventurous life. And we're doing, you were doing a lot of cool things. But what was it about Kelly and Emily that you were just like, yeah, we should pick up a move to Spain? What did you see in them? Um, I, I felt like I had unfinished business here. Okay. Um, you know, uh, not so much from Barcelona, but almost from St. John on, um, I felt like, um, almost like it was coming home. Does that make sense? 
Yes. Um, and he, and my daughter said to me, she said uh, at one point, she said, I feel like we live in Spain now. Um, and we were probably three quarters of the way through the Camino. And, and she, she expressed regret for having to go home, you know, um, after we were done. And we were both really, really mourned it. Um, you know, we stayed for two additional weeks. We went to France to see friends and then we stayed in Tarragona on the Mediterranean, which I love Tarragona. Um, but, you know, it's that sort of, I, I call, it's like, you know, you have a vacation hangover on steroids, right? Yeah. Um, and it was like almost a morning. And then we went home and, um, you know, you just aren't the same after you walk a Camino, especially a long Camino. And Jeff saw that you saw, we weren't mm -hmm. the same. Yep. Um, and I, and I think I just, I couldn't keep doing what I was doing. I couldn't go home and get back into the rat race. Yeah. So, yeah. I think I really identify with that feeling. See and um, that's what I was asking Jeff. You know, what did you see? What what changes did you see in Kelly when she came back? Um, she was energized. <laughs> she had a lot of energy, and and she just kind of playfully said, "We, you know, what do you think about moving to Spain?" And I I said, "Let's do it because we don't do anything small. We go all in every <laughs> time." <laughs> so, I mean. Why not? Well, when else are you going to do it? So why not do it now? So that's what we did. Okay. Yeah. So the first place you picked was in Valencia, which is not, you know, really on the Camino Frances. Um, what made you decide on Valencia first? And then what made you decide to leave Valencia and move to Galicia? Um, originally, I thought we would move uh, more toward Tarragona. And then mm. the situation in Catalonia was not was, was they had the vote that year, the secession vote, and we weren't sure what was going to happen. And so we went, I kind of went down the coast and said, okay, so let's do Valencia. I, I wanted to be in a place that had good transportation and, um, and a city like environment. That's really what I wanted to do. Thought kind of thought we wouldn't need a car. Um, Valencia has a great metro s system, um, lots of history, um, and it's on the med. So, um, you know, it seemed like a good place to land. Um, we said, we'll do it for six months. Yep. Uh, we'll, we'll start out with six months and then we'll see where we want it be. Mm -hmm. And six months, about 18 months later, we <laughs> started looking, we knew we didn't want to stay in, in hot, sweaty Valencia. No. <laughs> um, and we knew Galicia was where we wanted to be. Okay. Um, and we started about 18 months in, we started uh, looking at real estate. Um, so this is probably fall of 2019. Mm -hmm. um, we got serious about it, came up here. Uh, we walked a Camino for a week um, just to kind of see, you know, is this really where we want to be? And then the next month we came up here and spent a week with real estate agents going all over the place. Okay. Um, and, and then COVID hit. That's what happened. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So how did, so how did you, did the realtor find the actual place that you purchased or did you guys see it as you were walking? We, we saw it as we were walking. Every and... pilgrim's dream. <laughs> <laughs> saw the sign. You but saw we didn't the act sign. on it. Well, yes, but we didn't, we didn't act on it when we were here. We, COVID hit and months and months went by, um, like, oh, like a year went by. And actually in the, yes, a year went by, yes. And I was looking online at real estate listings online and we recognized the house that we'd seen before still for sale. And so then we reached out to the owners. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. So how long have you been there? Not, not that long. Uh, end of April. Yeah. Yeah. It took about six months for the purchase to go through. Okay. Um, but yeah, since, since the very end of April, we moved here the 28th of April. Yeah. Okay. And what are you thinking so far? How is it behind the curtain, you know, like on the other side, <laughs> you, you've gone from being a pilgrim yeah. to expats to now being on the other side of the Camino experience by supporting pilgrims as they walk by and kind of being a, a part of the Camino culture there. How is it different? 
Um, I, I would say that obviously the walking, um, it's, it's very different when you're looking at people living along the way. Um, because, you know, they have their own lives, they have their own thing going on, you know, whether it's farming or industry or whatever their thing is. Um, and it's a little bit harder to connect with them. You know, you say hola or buenos dias or whatever, but um, being an expat in on the Mediterranean um, was very different. It was, it was mm -hmm. um, kind of the antithesis of being a pilgrim. Um, mm. And so we got to, we got to experience that, um, that sort of culture, I mm -hmm. guess. Yeah, definitely. And it is a culture. Yes. What, what do you mean by that, Kelly? Um, you know, there's a lot of people, I would say your, your general expat is probably retired in mm -hmm. Spain um, and doesn't have as much going on, um, on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, they have, they have probably hobbies, but, but not, um, not employment. Mm -hmm. Um, lots of, you know, less Americans, more Brits, more maybe, um, Germans or, you know, yeah. but, um, I would say moving here. Well, when we lived in Valencia, I purposefully rented an apartment that, um, was not filled with the area was not filled with expats. Okay. So all of our neighbors spoke Spanish or they sp spoke Valenciano. So we wanted to integrate with the culture. We wanted to learn Spanish. We wanted to have Spanish friends. Um, it was very different. Um, Valencians are uh, in, in our experience, well, friendly, um, their view of an expat is very different than here. So Galicia is like, open your arms. Um, we were here maybe three days when Marie mm -hmm. Carmen, yes. our next door neighbor, came over and brought us vegetables from her garden. Um, we, we, um, everyone in town is just absolutely embraced us. Um, we couldn't have asked for a better place no, to land. No. When I compare it to the expat experience in Valencia, it's night and day. Yeah. Um, we will never move from here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Everybody here knows us. And we we learned that when we walked into town after being here for a week, we walked the five kilometers into, into town to have dinner. And we took a taxi back home and the taxi driver didn't ask us where we wanted to go. He knew who we were. And he's like, I know who you are. <laughs> and he wow. drove us right home and he yes. showed us where he lived along the way too. Yes. yes. A, a lot different than uh, living in Seattle or wherever you probably yes. were in Arizona, right? And so where is town? Where, where, where do you walk into town? We walk into Malide. Okay. She um, into so Malide. we tech, we technically live in Palace de Rey and we do our, our sort of municipal things at the town hall in Palace de Rey. Okay. But we walk into Malide or we drive into Malide to go to the grocery store or whatever, you know, those, those types of things, the hardware stores in, in Malide. Yeah. Mm. Oh, I bet everybody so, listening and watching is so envious remembering walking into there. And that's just where you go to shop. <laughs> that's yes. so fun. <laughs> yes. That's where everything is. is yeah. 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 And, and a lot of our friends are there now, you know, they own businesses there and, and are very, very, you know, helpful. They're so helpful for anything that we need. And, and they, you know, every, they always introduce us. These are the Americans, you know, um, <laughs> in Palace de Rey, we're number what? 84 and 85? 84 and 85. Uh-huh. Of since 2006, we're number 84 and 85 of immigrants. Um, so. Oh, wow. Really? Yes. Very nice. So Kelly, I want to go back to your Camino. Um, and just kind of get an idea of, you know, when you look back and you say, wow, this was the hardest day and then contrast that to, you know, the best day that you walked. So what day did you find the most challenging for yourself? Um, golly. I mean, the first one was rough just because I didn't really know what to expect. You know, you read a lot on those forums and you, and you, and you look at photos, like you said, it's two-dimensional. 
Right. Um, and then the, the reality, and I was walking with a 15 year old who was incredibly in shape <laughs> and she's looking at me like, you know, she's a hundred yards ahead going, come on, come on, you know? So that was a, that was a tough day just from the kind of shock of, oh my gosh, you know, what is this like? Um, but I, I will say, I, I kind of break my Camino up into sections so it's really, to me, the first week I called the trail of tears um, mm. and I cried a lot. Um, my daughter walked ahead a lot. Um, she was, she, she met people and, and she's faster than I am. And usually we would, I'd say, you know, meet me in Zubiri or meet me in Azorfa or wherever it happens to be. And she'd be like, okay. And she would take off. So, um, so I spent a lot of time alone on my Camino, ironically, even though I was with my daughter. And, and I will say that first week was probably first seven days was probably, probably the trail of tears. Um, second seven days was probably, you know, not so many tears and, and the pain, the physical pain of it had started to kind of subside. And then, you know, got to the Meseta, um, from Burgos to Lyon. And I know people talked about it like it, like it's just, you know, you either bike it or you should take a bus around it, or it's just, you know, the seventh level of hell. I <laughs> loved the Meseta. And, Did you and really? my daughter, okay. oh, I loved it. And, and my daughter said the same thing. Emily, Emily was like, mom, that was some of the most beautiful um, parts of the whole Camino. And, and I felt like that's where I, I started to meet my stride. Um, I got a cadence. I understood what to do. I, and, and the last two weeks was just a joy. The last two weeks waking up every day in the dark at, you know, four 30 or five and putting it all on and going was, was a joy. You know, I, once we hit Sogun, I felt, we both felt this way it was almost a sadness because we knew that every day we were closer to Santiago mm -hmm. and it just, and you didn't want to get there, you know, right. but it was Don't also, but you also felt like you were strong and you conquered your fear and the pain and the emotional difficulty and all these, all these sort of trials that you go through on, on a Camino and and so there's joy as well as tears. Yeah. So. What was your hardest trial? Oh, golly. That's pretty personal. It's a really personal one. But I think, I think I felt like my, at a, in Astorga, my daughter and I sat down and we had a really long talk. Mm -hmm. And it was great. It was really good. And we walked together after Astorga every day. So it was good. As a mama, I can yeah. <laughs> I feel a, wow, very envious that you got to do that with your daughter at 15, right? Yeah. And, and also yeah. that your daughter even got to walk at 15. You know, I'm thinking, you know, I did it at the young age of 54, I think. I can't imagine having that gift at 15 and then being able to share that gift with your daughter. That must have been amazing. Yeah, it was good. We, we, we talk about it all the time and she knows I'm going next week. And, and, uh, and I said, I wish you were here. And she's like, I wish I was there too, but she can't be. Yeah. Wow. All right. Yeah. So you guys are getting ready to walk. So you guys are going to be starting, uh, are you, are you starting to send John and both of you are walking with Pyrenees. Um, so not your veteran pilgrims, you know, what are the top three, four things that you're like, man, make sure you have that in your backpack. Uh, duct tape. <laughs> duct tape. All right. Oh, duct tape. Yeah. Um, Cause you can use it for everything. Um, for me, the Swiss army knife you bought me mm -hmm. that, that, you know, multi-tool Swiss army knife um, and definitely a sewing kit. Um, I, I never had a blister um, on my first Camino, um, okay. but I threaded a lot of other people's blisters. Um, and, and I think people don't understand the value of, of threading a blister, but it really works. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, tell us, what do you do? I don't know if I know how to I mean, do that. Well, you, you know, you, it's just thread. Um, you don't put a knot in it and you, uh, dip it in alcohol, obviously, 
and and then just put it through the put it through the um, the blister and then just take the needle off and leave it oh, and it okay. will and it will drain the blister um, without allowing bacteria to get in it um, and it won't pop and then you don't have the same problems that you know, so many, so many pilgrims have a lot of blisters and I, I met many, many people, some who literally had to stop their Camino because mm. of blisters and, and this just sort of drains them and he, and they heal. So, wow. okay. Well, that's yeah. fantastic too. Okay. So on the reverse side, what, what are some things that you're like, why are you packing that people? You don't need it. Cause I know you've said on your blog post, like, Spain has everything and you know, you can buy almost everything you need. Um, and I, everyone, I will have uh, links for their blog and, and whatnot. So don't worry, you'll be able to look them up. But um, okay. what is that thing that, you know, you're kind of like, guys, don't put that in there. You don't need it. What would be the top three things you don't um, need? Top three things that you don't need. Trying to think of what was on the table in Roncesvalles that everybody did you did you see that table no, at the no. big at, there's a the big monastery albergue in Roncesvalles after everybody crosses the Pyrenees there's this big table and it was piled <laughs> with things that people literally were like there is after two days of walking over the Pyrenees or one day some people did it in one day uh, they were there's no way they were going to carry that for another 790 <laughs> kilometers. Do you remember um, anything funny on the table? Lots of space blank blankets. Space um, blankets, like those things yeah. after a marathon? Yeah. Yeah. Lots okay. Of, lots of those people, people had those. Um, there were, there were at that time tents, people had brought their tents and then they realized they didn't need them. Of course, now with COVID, you might need it. Right. Um, uh, so there's these, I don't know how to describe it. So they sell them at REI. It's like, uh, so you can you go to the bathroom out in the, as a woman out into the woods. Uh-huh. There were those on that table. Like people realized I, I don't need to carry this thing with me. I can like just, a little shovel. No, like a, like a tube with a funnel. Oh, oh, the, the forget the, what those things are called. So for females, so you can stand and pee. Yes. Yes. Um, <laughs> okay. there were those on the table. Um, so <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, I think people realize like, I'm not carrying this thing with me for the next six weeks or whatever, however long mm -hmm. they were going to take to do it. So, um, yeah, there were those things on there. There were, um, lots of water bladders, um, mm -hmm. on that table. Um, now I've seen people walking by that have them and they're using them. And that's, I think that's great. I think that's a personal choice, but, um, yeah, I, I got REI's list, um, and, and bought everything. You know, that we went to mm -hmm. REI and bought every teeny little tiny thing mm -hmm. that was on there. And, uh, you know, I, like, I think I've said it on my blog, I didn't need three bandanas, you know, <laughs> and every, every, everything has weight. Right. <laughs> so, um, so the, does your bag look a lot different for this next one you're going on than it looked that oh, first time? Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah. Very, very, very different. <laughs> yeah. And the number of clothes that I thought I needed, um, I realized that I, I needed to be wearing a pair and have two, two changes of clothes in the, in my bag. Um, and then at night, there's a lot of people who I read before I went that brought pajamas or bought, mm -hmm. brought a dress to wear into town or those kinds of things. And basically what I did is every day I put on what I was going to wear the next day mm -hmm. and I slept in it. Mm -hmm. And then I woke up in the morning, put my socks on, put my boots on and, and left in the dark. That's, yeah, perfect. that's sort of what we did. So that would be that's, that's my recommendation of kind of how to manage your, the weight in your pack and clothing and all that. Wonderful. Okay. Those are some great tips. Um, not many of those oh, yeah. things have been shared before. So that's wonderful. Well, the other thing I would also recommend is um, buying underwear in very strange colors <laughs> um, because you're hanging them on a line with a lot of other people and oh. all my bras, my black sports bras were gone within by Lagronio because oh, no. I think people, people didn't know. I mean, they look, they look like everybody else's, right? Right. And so um, I had to buy, I had to buy bras and Legronio and I realized, 
um, I really should have, you know, the best thing you can do is buy like leopard print or bright pink or something. <laughs> <laughs> I shall go shopping because all of mine are black. So that's a great tip. That's the same thing. Yeah. So. Well, that's wonderful. Okay. I want to, because we kind of talked about, we've already brought up the word P already. I have not discussed this ever on the podcast, but we're going to get into it because um, Jeff, I think I saw um, you had put this great bit of your blog post on one of the Facebook groups about, hey, pilgrims, we can do better. I think it was you, Jeff, that wrote it, or maybe Kelly, maybe you wrote it. <laughs> Kelly I, wrote I, just, it. I just feel like your name was on there, Jeff, for some reason. But anyway, uh, probably. probably. <laughs> <laughs> Maria had shared it, and um, I was like, oh, my gosh. But, you know, the, the whole thing was kind of like, hey, pilgrims, we can do better. So I'd really like to kind of talk about you know, people that are listening right now have maybe already walked the Camino or, go, or are going to go again or for the first time. And, you know, it's easy as a pilgrim, I think, to begin to walk and not realize that these are real people having real lives, which you just mentioned earlier, Kelly, that yeah. the people supporting us as we walk, they're real people. They're not employees of the And they're in their lives and I think that you mentioned maybe in that blog post that you know people were sneaking behind your gate and peeing in your yard which you know we wouldn't really do that <laughs> where we live you know as badly as I need to go maybe sometimes I would not do that uh, where I'm currently living so I, I wonder if you guys can just kind of touch on you know hey pilgrims here's some tips here's some things you can do better um, can we talk about that post <laughs> Yeah. Maybe share the things that you're seeing. I think there was like garbage being put in your fence line, uh, in your mailbox. Yes. And yes. so can you kind of, for people that haven't seen that blog post, can you talk about that and maybe some ways that we can behave um, more respectfully while we're out there and to remember that this is a, a real place that real people are living. You can you want to start. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's just treat it like it's your own, like, like you live there. I basically just be more respectful. I mean, um, yeah, we have people that, that have throw, you know, open our gate to come in and throw their garbage in our recycling bins, and then we have to go and sort it out, or they put their garbage in our mailbox or stuff like that. So it's and that's that's one of the things about living right on the Camino. I mean, we have a thousand people that walk in front of our house every day. Yeah. Um, the other thing that I think would go a long way to to making the locals happy is um, be respectful for cars. Like groups of people walk down the middle of the street and when cars come, they don't want to get out of the way. So um, just think about, would you do that in your own house or your own, your own town? Um, just simple, simple stuff, pretty much. It's, but we, it's the stuff that we experience every day. Every day. Why is there garbage being put in your mailbox? I don't understand. <laughs> we, we really didn't understand it either. Um, I they, think it's because that we are about a hundred meters short of where the dumpster is and they yes. don't know that if they just walked another 100 meters there's a great big public dumpster that they can throw their garbage away and before that it's probably a couple kilometers since the last garbage can yes so yeah. they just they don't know we thought about putting a sign on the gate that said the dumpster is 100 meters <laughs> down the way that's a great um, idea yeah yeah um but we also want to be as supportive of of pilgrims as we can it's yeah it's not that we're, um, we chose to live here. We wanted to be Camino adjacent mm -hmm. um, and, the, and the culture. Yeah, oh yeah, definitely. We love the culture of it um, and supporting folks. And, and there's an energy that's here that you know because you walk the Camino. So you know what that energy is. Yes. We live it every day right. now just by being close to it. And, and so there's, that's a privilege. We, and we understand that. We just want to make sure that uh, everybody gets to enjoy it at the same level, right? right? Yeah. If there's trash everywhere, then the people who come up behind you aren't, aren't going to have the same experience. So, yeah. You know, my, my friend Ken, who lives at the Stone Boat in Ravenal, way down the road from you, uh, talks about this river of Camino energy just flowing right by her door. Um, what does that feel like? I, like? I can't even imagine to like look out your window and, you know, I just went the weekend with a bunch of pilgrims, which was awesome, but you guys are seeing that every single day. I know maybe during COVID, not as much as we, you know, would have, if that hadn't happened, but I'm just saying that's, it's picking back up. There are people coming by your house. I'm imagining every single day right now. Sometimes 2000 people. 
2,000 people. What does that feel yep. like to have 2,000 people coming by? Are you kind of getting, you know, like a big deal or is it still like <laughs> goosebump people? Um, we're, we're getting used to it. When we first moved here, um, we there weren't very many pilgrims because it was April and we would see maybe a couple dozen and we go, oh, look, there's someone walking now. And then a month went by and it's like, oh, look, there's they've been walking by for hours. And now we get 2,000, uh, 2,500 pilgrims on a Tuesday or a Wednesday walking in front of our house. The other days are not quite as much. It's just because we're three days away from Saria. So yeah. everybody starts in rocks, walks a shorter, shorter Camino from Saria. Yeah. And but it takes them a couple of days to get here and they all come in as a, as a big group. Yeah. There's people singing, there's uh, music, we've That's horses, amazing. there's there's yes. all kinds of all kinds of pilgrims that go by. Yes. And it is interesting, you can tell the difference between the folks that started in Saria and the folks that started in Belgium or Germany or Lapuli yeah. or or St. John. Um, they have a different look to them. And they so? usually you, the ones in Saria are the singers and yes. the ones with the flag and they have matching shirts and those kinds of student, lots of students. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but the long haul walkers are, um, are they quiet? They're quiet. They're usually by themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or maybe it, maybe two people. Maybe two, yeah. Yeah. But even the two people walking, they're quiet. It's a very different, you, mm -hmm. you sense a different energy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I know one day I was reading one of your blogs, um, Kelly, and you were, I thought, if I had it correctly, that you were kind of talking about that there's this delicate balance uh, in living on the Camino that, you know, you might be tempted to run out to talk to every pilgrim, but sometimes you're needing to kind of step back and give them space. Um, yes. Yeah, so well, how does that work? Like, you know, are you just kind of reading their face, their energy as they're walking by? How do you know when that pilgrim needs space? I think you can tell. I think people have an energy field around them. Um, we say hello to a lot of people. We drink our coffee in the morning and people walk by the gate and and they look in and sometimes they take pictures and, and we wave and Buen Camino. Um, when I'm walking into Malide, you, you can tell the people that you can talk to or that you can interact with or even say Buen Camino to and people that you, that just, they're doing their own thing today. So um, I think, you know, it's that time, that one time it was pouring rain. Remember it was just monsoon raining mm -hmm. and you were like, oh, we should, and it, and it was May, early May, I think. Mm -hmm. There weren't many pilgrims and they were just, it was, it was a deluge um and Jeff said should we should we offer people to come and stand under the front porch you know until it breaks and I said no and if they if they ask of course they're welcome to do that but part of your Camino is is um you know I guess proving to yourself that you can get through difficult things and and you know those days in the rain that were hard um were were good days too just the rain isn't isn't what makes it a bad day right. so um so we feel like we're here we offer people water um to fill their water bottles in our in our well and and um we're here if people need us but i don't we we both have agreed we don't want to interfere with people's camino we're not we're not here to insert ourselves in their experience Mm, so. I love that. I love how you are um, not inserting yourself in their story, but yet if they need help, you're there as a supporter, is what I'm hearing. Yeah. But yeah. 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 I think that's beautiful. Have you created a stamp or anything? Or a stamp in the passports? Or anything? <laughs> we have. We have. We have created a stamp. <laughs> oh, what's it look like? Is that what's up in the corner? Yes. yes. Yeah. Yes. <gasps> Okay. Oh my gosh. It looks like a little yogi sitting meditating. Tell me about it. Yep. <laughs> yes. So we, we plan to open our, our happiness cafe food truck, um, yes. by the gate, um, right. next spring and, uh, why that? Well, so I knew we would, I would need a logo. Um, yes. and so I, I contracted with a guy in Czechoslovakia and he designed it for me and it was great. Um, and so I had this logo and then um, when the the shortage, the bed shortage became so 
you know, critical right. um, here. It was in the newspaper. Um, we were down to what, uh, 30%. Um, 30 or 35%. Yeah, like for, the, for the albergues that were open. Yeah. I mean, there were a lot of albergues that had already gone bankrupt. So it was 30% right. of those that were, were open. Um, and, uh, and pilgrims were sleeping outside. I think you all, you know all about this. They were sleeping right. outside in Porto Marin and, and there were nights where there were 200, over 200 people sleeping outside. And we wow, were, there were that many. Yes, oh, yeah. yes. And, and Palace de Rey, same type of thing. They just, they didn't have enough. And then, then they had an outbreak among the pilgrims and they had to take one whole albergue and turn it into a quarantine right. center for these folks. And, and we saw, we saw people walking that had, you know, clearly walked a long, long way just looking for beds. And we read an article in the newspaper about a, a couple that had walked from Saria to Palace in one day. Um, wow. Yeah, which is just almost just, I don't even know how you would do that. So uh, <laughs> we, I read that article. I was up early one morning and Jeff woke up and I said, here's the situation. And he said, let's go. So we went to Decathlon in Lugo and we were there when they opened and we bought 10 tents and 10 and, and 10 uh, sleeping pads. And we put them up wow. in our front yard and we put a sign on the gate and said, if you don't, if, if you, you know, you don't have a bed, we have tents. Excellent. So, so we started allowing pilgrims to come and, and sleep in the tents. And then we started serving olives and wine and then we started feeding them dinner and then we started feeding them breakfast and coffee <laughs> and it just started like built but it was so much fun <laughs> yeah. so you became an albergue overnight yes sort of well a, not, a free out a, a free, free one yes free we didn't one. charge the table right yeah we didn't no no, not no, even, no, no just free charge that. just, just free. free plan out free yeah yeah i made big things of lasagna or, or soup and and uh and more and more people started coming and then people started coming with their own tents and mm -hmm. saying, I, you know, do you have room? We didn't have room. So, but they had tents. So we let them put their tents up in our front yard and we got the shower and the hose. I mean, yeah. they were just, it was yeah. crazy. We talked to people from all over Europe that stopped by. It was mainly the people that stayed here were people from, there were the long hauler people, people that were, came from way upstream of Saria. Yeah, that's all we got. Now, are you still doing this or have you stopped doing it? We've stopped doing it because we're getting ready to leave oh, okay. and, yeah, and go on our, and go right. on our, our trip. And, and we really felt like we needed to sort of wrap that up and, and get everything ready to go here before we head out. So we aren't doing it anymore. And now the, now uh, the Albergers are operating at 50% yes. yeah. and contagion has gone way, way down here. It's much safer here. And I, I have a feeling that we're not long from them being open 75%. So the bed okay. capacity went up about the time that we stopped doing it. So the, the locals were very okay. interested. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. bet. So. Were they supportive of this? Because, you know, you have people camping in your yard, which, you know, that's been a question about wild camping, right? Um, during this whole COVID thing, when there's been a bed shortage. So I, I wanna kind of talk about a couple of things on this. You say that you're seeing a difference because there were reports, like you said, about Port Moran and that people were sleeping outside. I didn't know the number was that high. Yeah. Um, are you still hearing that there are bed shortages uh, in that last 100 kilometers? Yes. Yeah. Uh huh. Um, depends on the day you talk about that. Cause... Yeah, it depends on where you. So people start, the, the, the groups of people sort of move in waves. So everybody kind of leaves Sari on a Sunday and they. <laughs> get to Porto Marin on a Monday, they get to Palace on a Tuesday, they get to Malede on, on a Wednesday. So it's the same group of people creating these big shortages one day a week as they move along. One or two. One yes. or two days, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. So depending on where you are, that you, you could have a shortage of beds in any given town. So the best thing to do is if you can get a bed, stay where you are. If you're in that wave, mm -hmm. stay an extra day because because then you the wave moves on and then you're well, just a day behind the wave which means that you won't you won't miss out on a bed will they let you stay that second day right now you stay in a, you can stay in a different albergue okay so to stay in a different albergue mm -hmm. okay yeah like you guys, that reminds me i think you guys did have a blog post about starting different days like you know maybe not leaving sorry right on sunday or yeah. kind of yeah. varying that 
And what, yep. what was the day that you had recommended? Was there? Oh, you said Tuesday through Friday. I yeah, think yeah, said. yeah. If you can leave Tuesday through Friday, you will not be in that wave. That's sorry, a wave. Okay, I, I like how you're calling that. That's very good. Yeah. So, are you thinking that this is uh, also because it's been August and we have you know a lot of standards? I imagine walking during this holiday month. I'm guessing. Is yes. that true? Yes. Okay. Uh, and then also a lot of Europeans finishing up. Uh, their trips for the summer and so I know a lot of Europeans will kind of divide their Caminos up in a couple of weeks and you know come one year and do a section and next year do another section um, so I guess what I'm asking is do you think that the shortage from the Saria is is kind of going to go away after August into September and that people starting their walks in September and October maybe won't see these same shortages or do you think that's just completely unknown at this point I think that school doesn't start here until for a couple more weeks. Okay. Um, so, you know, it's possible that it'll, it'll continue just until the middle of September, but people are going back to work. Um, kids will go back to school um, where we are already starting to see there's less pilgrims every day than there were before. Mm -hmm. um, so when you say, uh, you know, I, 200 beds is a lot, but like I said, the capacity now is 50%. That's when it was at 30%. Um, so I think the, the tipping point is starting to, starting to um, go in the, in the pilgrim's favor as far as bed capacity. And the contagion's going down. So they're opening up more and more. So yeah, yeah. such good news. So the whole wild camping, has that been a little more tolerated during <laughs> all of this or is it still not okay to just you know pitch your tent I think I think it's tolerated as long as you're being respectful if you don't have it shouldn't have a campfire as long as you can practice leave no trace mm -hmm. I don't think anything anybody would give you a hard time okay. you could probably camp in a in a municipal park without and if, if so if a if a police officer came and talked to you he would understand he wouldn't throw you in jail or fine you or whatever no. they they would be like you can't you there's no room you got to stay somewhere it's either sleeping in a tent or you're sleeping on a bench or laying on the sidewalk yeah. so they'd prefer you to be in a tent i think because you're a little safer i will say the guardia seville here yeah um you know galithia's galithia relies on those pilgrims and pilgrims coming um these these towns rely on them mm -hmm. um and the police are patrolling the Camino constantly. Yep. Um, we see them constantly along here. Mm -hmm. um, and we see them on ATVs and horseback and, and you know, they're here to support the pilgrims. Um, I, I, you don't see them. I see the Guardia Seville as almost a facilitator of the Camino mm -hmm. and less of a, a I guess, you know, reprimanding people yeah. doing the wrong thing. You right. know, they understand these people are out here trying to do something that is um, is really noble and they and they want to support that. You you can talk about your interaction with the <laughs> with the Guardia Seville. They stopped by the house here because they wanted to know if we were up running a campground with all the tents in the front yard. Oh boy, okay. And so I thought, oh, maybe I'm in a little bit of trouble here. <laughs> Even though it's free. Even though it's all everything is free, and but we were taking down people's names and their passport number and do all the stuff that the albergues are doing for contact tracing. Yes. Mm -hmm. And when they saw that and they then they heard that we were everything was free, um, they were okay with it. They were they were a little concerned that um, if something bad happened on our property, we could be liable for it. Mm -hmm. That was their only concern of the whole thing. But they said yeah. you're but not they, doing anything illegal. We're not doing anything illegal and. So what I recommend people who are thinking about camping or bringing a tent along the Camino and they can't find a place to stay, ask, ask one of the property owners, a private property owner, if they can just camp in their front yard. Because I've talked to several people and our neighbors are like, sure, you can camp in our yard. But so you just have to be brave enough to go up and knock on a door and ask. With, with, with your cell phone in Google Translate and say, could I have no bed to sleep and I'm a pilgrim. Can I can I pitch my tent here? And I guarantee you, probably nine out of 10 Gallegos will tell you, okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. So um, you are thinking about starting a food truck, a Happiness Cafe food truck. Is that? Yes. Yes. So, okay. So 
next year. Okay, so on your blog, you had some information about that you're writing a book, which we're going to get to in the second, or you've already written it, but um, you're going to start a podcast, you're going to open an opera and also have the food truck. How are you guys doing all this? Do you have like a... <laughs> Is it just the two of you are there? None of your kids yeah. are with you right now. No, our right? kids are all all back in the U.S. So they're okay. grown or in college or working. Okay. Um, so it's just us two. So how are you guys going to do all this? That's a lot. So um, the the albergue side of things, I think, will what we really want to do is an eco albergue. So our mm -hmm. idea is like small um, sustainable cabins. Um, we're not planning on doing something that is, you know, going to be the traditional big warehousey type thing with bunk beds. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, my feeling was that, and you, you had this too, when you walked, um, by the time you've reached here, you are done with the bunk bed. You know, mm. if, if there's an option to kind of have some privacy and, and all of that, you would, you'd be up for that. So, um, so we're going to build those, um, but that, that's not for next year. Um, okay. that's, that's down the road. Okay. Um, so the writing is something I do all the time. So that's not a, that's not something I'm not an additive thing, just the, the food truck. So, um, we figured, you know, we've got all this space. We have quite a large piece of property. Um, we're right on the Camino. Um, we got a good spot right next to the gate. Um, there's a whole lot of people who are, um, interested in, you know, getting water, getting something to drink, having something to eat, taking a break at this point. Mm -hmm. um, and um, we feel like it's a good spot. So um, I'm gonna oh, so have it manufactured in, in Barcelona and yeah. then we'll just tow it here and and open open for business. Doing, doing this little campground, uh, that happy camper pop-up albergue campground that I called it, <laughs> <laughs> pop -up free campground on the Camino, um, really kind of helped us understand sort of what that was all about mm -hmm. um, and how to do it and how not to do mm -hmm. it and what people were interested in. And so, you know, Jeff was like, this is, this is like a startup, you know, we're just, we're giving it away for free right now just to see how it goes and to learn. And, and then we'll, and then we'll go live next, next spring. So. Wow. That's so cool. So, so the um, food truck won't be one you'll be driving around. It's going to be more of a fixed building that will on your property yes but not yes. inside your home no right mm -mm. cool and we'll have tables and and you know uh a cover for the to get out of the weather um because people will want that um it rains a lot here um mm -hmm. when it's not summertime so um yeah we're super excited i will learn a ton yeah um yeah yeah and i i'm really interested in in um doing a podcast from the cafe yes uh yes and, you know, opportunistically meeting people and saying, you know, would you like to sit down and tell your story? And, and I think, you know, we, we talked to a lot of folks that came and stayed in the, in the tents when we were um, operating that and people's stories while they're on the Camino are so amazing. Um, and especially when you have folks that have walked for a really long time, the things they have to share about what they've learned by this point, three days from Santiago, is profound yes. and it wasn't, I mean, it's yeah, pretty, it was. pretty yeah. incredible. Some of these, I mean, we would, we'd be like, you know, they'd come at two o'clock or three o'clock in the afternoon and, you know, there's no way they were going to get a bed in Melide. So they were thrilled to have a spot and we'd sit down and have a glass of wine with them. And all of a sudden, you know, three hours went by listening to their, to their stories. And, and I just, I'd like to, I'd like to be able to facilitate much like you, I'd like to be able to facilitate <laughs> that, but at a point on the Camino that um, where people are sort of cracked open, you know, ready to share. Yeah, you're in a great location for that. Well, first off, I mean, you know, I, I just kind of started this whole thing, you know, it just kind of uh, organically grew, but if I can uh -huh. be of any help, I would definitely love to help you. And and I got to tell you, being able to speak to pilgrims, uh, I probably speak to two or three pilgrims a week, and it is just going to uh, light up your world. Like there's nothing like, you know, there's nothing like hearing a Camino story. And I think um, we pilgrims like to talk about our Caminos. So I think that it's a way for us to give back as pilgrims is to allow 
another pilgrim to have a place to share their story. I think it's so powerful. Yes. So I'm so excited that you're doing that. Um, I think that's great. So let me know how I can help you when you get to that point. And um, we'll make sure that we get, you know, all of your information out on our Facebook page and all that kind of stuff as well. So, great. wow, so many things. I think I could talk to you guys for hours, um, but we are way beyond, I think, the amount of time that I promised oh, I would okay. take from you tonight. Um, so I, I just kind of want to end it with, you know, there's my favorite quote about the Camino is that, you know, the Camino doesn't give you what you think you want. It gives you what you need. Yes. And I'm wondering at this point, looking back to 2017, you know, you had a reason to walk. But now looking back, look where you are. You know, like <laughs> you, you're not just, you didn't just walk, you've moved. To Spain and not just moved to Spain, but moved literally on the path. Yes. You probably couldn't have imagined that happening when you set foot that first day in Spain. So uh, tell me a little bit about, you know, how it feels right now to have this dream come true. Is it a dream? Is it uh, a vocation? You know, like, what is it? What did it give? What did it provide you that you now know looking back you needed? Wow, that's big. That's a big, that's a big question. Um, I think, you know, when I started walking, I said it today and in, in my blog post today, actually, I, I really had no idea what I was in for. Um, and I stood outside that albergue on that balcony um, at night was in St. John. My daughter was asleep and I couldn't sleep. I was very nervous, you know, about what was coming the next day. I mean, I'm, you're in, you're in St. John, you look up, there's mountains and yeah. you're going up. Right? right. And I, and I, you know, I wasn't in the best shape I'd ever been in my life. You know, I wasn't 25 right. and I just stood out there and I, I looked at the stars and I, I, thought, oh my gosh. And I just thought, you know, I, I need to say a prayer. And I, I held my hands up and I said, you know, whatever this is going to be, you know, I don't, I don't know what this is going to be, but whatever it's going to be, I'm open to it. And, and at that moment, I felt like, okay, like I, I, it's going to be, it's okay that I don't know. Um, and it kind of cracked me open for whatever came down the road with me, you know, or for me. And, um, and I, I couldn't have imagined, um, even when we were in Santiago, I couldn't have imagined that I would come home and Jeff would say, okay, you know, so it's, a, it's a crazy thing. Like people talk about it, but you never do it. Right. right. And, uh, and I, I, you know, I said this to you today, actually, it's, he's a remarkable person in that you, know, you are, because, you know, there's a lot of people that come home and I, I felt this, I, I came back and I, I had a hard time relating to friends um, because they were, they were, they continued to live the life that I lived before and then nothing against that. But right. we had had now, now there was a chasm between us. Um, and I, and I, I, I felt bad. I kind of mourned that. Um, but I think it brought Jeff and I closer together actually. And he embraced the person that came back from, from her Camino, you know, fully embraced me and didn't have expectations that I was going to become, I was going to go back to the person I had been before. He understood that that I was different now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and he was all in. So that that I was very lucky. That's the mm -hmm. only way that all this happened. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I, I think I'm not far from your place. Uh, someone told me that you know I was so excited to get to Santiago and, and couldn't wait. And they just kind of looked at me and said, "Oh, it doesn't end there." It's just starting. Yes. And I think you two are living proof that your Camino still go on and it's going strong. Yeah. 
Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's true. And, and I think, you know, now that we, you know, Jeff walked for a week, um, we both walked together in October of 2019 and you got a taste of it. And I remember mm. you said to me, I could do this for a month mm. and it was mm. pouring, pouring rain on the way to pour Marin. And you said that. Yeah. And now that we live on the Camino and we're, we're next to all that energy every day. Mm-hmm. We wake up to the click clacks of walking sticks every morning. Every morning. <laughs> and you you know that you know that energy and you know that mm-hmm. feeling. And so um it's nice to have have a partner in life to share that with who understands it. Yeah. Well, I can't imagine and waking up to that every morning. And I think it's so cool. I, I would imagine that maybe people that haven't walked yet that are listening or watching this interview to see that you guys live right there and you still walk and you're getting ready to walk again. Uh, And I would love to catch up with you if you have good Wi-Fi and we can catch up part way through your next walk. Um, It'd be great to get some live reports on how things are going because I know a lot of people that are planning Caminos right now, you know, there's so much talk on Facebook, uh, a lot of um, guessing and predicting, you know, and so I really like to talk to people that are out there and seeing with their own eyes what's happening, even though that can change, obviously, uh, from day to day, but I I just think, no, for me that, you know, I'm getting to walk as well and I'm getting ready to go and uh, being able to hear what's happening live is just so powerful. So yeah, happy yeah, to do it. Be great. And I also, and I really, I want to meet the both of you when I get to Spain um, and um, keep up with your story and um, be able to share with folks all the great things that you're doing. I think this is uh Every pilgrim's dream, I think, pretty much is to, uh, you know, you see those for sale signs, it's pretty tempting to go, to go in there and live. But uh, like you said, not everybody does it. And I think when you when you actually go and do it, it's, it's just amazing. It's amazing to watch. So thank you for coming to the Camino Cafe and sharing uh, your story. This has been so fun getting to meet you. And well, thanks um, for having us. <laughs> well, you're very welcome. You're welcome back to the Camino Cafe anytime. And hopefully we can do a, a live chat while you're out there walking and uh, hear more. So thank you so much. And viewers, listeners, please give us a thumbs up, a rating. Um, you know, and any comments, I know that uh, Kelly and Jeff would probably love to hear from you. And, you know, this has been a still a hard year, right, for all of us. And so uh, any comments just kind of gives us that extra pilgrim energy to keep on going and um, waiting for that bigger river of pilgrims to start coming as the world heals. So um, anyway, thank you so much, everyone. And until next time, welcome Camino. You know. Welcome Camino. You know. Kelly and Jeff, if you'll just stay on for a second, we'll uh, say goodbye. Right.